2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. And we'll begin looking at verse number 3. The Bible says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth and tangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We began looking at, last time, here in verse 3, at the phrase, A good soldier of Jesus Christ. A good soldier of Jesus Christ. We want to continue to look at that thought today uh, from verse 3 and verse 4. Hopefully, we're going to trust the Lord to help us today. Let's pray. Father, we do need your help. We can't do anything without you. We have no hope without you. We can't be a good soldier without you. May you burn this in our hearts today. May you help us to be ready to war because you are preparing us and we're allowing you to prepare us. Would you teach us some things through your word today? Maybe remind us of some things in your word today that we need to be reminded of. And Lord, if there's one here today that's not sure that they're in your army, may they get assurance of that today. Maybe they know they're not in your army. Maybe they don't realize they're in the devil's army, but they, don't, but they know they're not in your army. May you, may you teach them today. May you constrain them by your love today to help them understand their need of you and that they would repent and come to you as Savior. Lord, we would rejoice in that. We rejoice in everything that you want to do in our life because we don't deserve it. So take your word. Be thorough with us today. We'll thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. A good soldier of Jesus Christ. We said in this passage of Scripture here, just in rehashing some things and getting our mind back to where we were at, um, last time we talked about 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, is when you look through uh, verses 1 through 7, uh, it starts out talking about the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And it says, be strong in the grace. And then it tells you some things that we're going to be strong in, in God's grace here. And so we see that grace makes us strong in verse 1. We see in verse 2 that grace makes us a disciple. And not only that, once we walk with God, we're supposed to be a disciple maker. We're supposed to turn around and help other people be disciples. And then in verse 3 and 4, which we're looking at now, grace helps us to be a soldier. When we get to verse 5, it makes us an athlete. When we get to verse 6, it, it makes us an husbandman, this grace. In verse 7, grace makes us to understand. We need the Lord's grace. We can't do any of these things that we're supposed to be doing without God's grace. And, and again, I'll tell you that um, <clears throat> grace is activated in our life from God when we believe Him. And when we put our faith in Him and trust Him. And as believers, we are in the Lord's army. The Bible says in verse 4 that He may, play, and he may please Him who has chosen him to be a soldier. When a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they become a child of God, the Bible tells us. We were looking at this in Sunday school this morning. And uh, in John chapter 1 and verse 12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, who's him? Jesus Christ. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So believing and receiving Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches that we can become a son of God or a child of God. And we also looked at previously that we become an ambassador of Jesus Christ. If you were to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you find that, that we had the ministry of reconciliation. And as an ambassador, we're to carry that out. We're sent from God. And we also found that we're a soldier of Jesus Christ when we get saved. Not after we get saved. It's not something that we learn about and we, and we determine or decide that we want to do. This is who we are. And the Lord expects for us to carry this out in our life with His power, of course, and His help. And uh, as you read the Bible, you'll continue to understand things that the Lord has for you that He put in your life when you got saved, that you're continuing to understand and continuing to uh, allow Him to develop in your life. Now, if you're not a believer here today, you're not in the Lord's army. It's only that person who's believed and received that's a child of God. 
um, you're not in the Lord's army, but in opposition to that, you're in the devil's army. And you say, that's pretty harsh, Brother Justin, for you to say that. Well, I'm in good company because in John 8, 44, Jesus said that. And I think I can say anything that Jesus says with a clear conscience. And he said in John chapter 8 and verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's the devil. And every man without Jesus Christ as their Savior is a sinner, and a good sinner at best, <laughs> but a sinner. And on their way to hell, where the Lord didn't create for any man. He created for the devil and his fallen angels there. But we have to be born again by faith to become part of God's family and be in his family. Now, the people Jesus was talking to in John chapter 8 were, uh, um, were the Jews, and they were religious Jews. They were religious Jews. And there were, he was making the point that their works and love proved that God was not their father, but the devil. So there is something about our works. Our works don't get us to heaven. But there is something about your works showing something about your life and what you love showing something about your life. So what does verses 3 and 4 tell us about uh, a good soldier of Jesus Christ and what that looks like? Well, we started looking at verse 3 um, last time. And the Bible says here in verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So first of all, we said a good soldier endures hardness. This deals with our durability, our durability. We said to endure hardness, we have to know where our strength comes from. To endure hardness, we have to be prepared. And to endure hardness, we have to put forth effort. We talked about those things. Are we going to endure the hardness? Our strength comes from the Lord. He does prepare us, and He does give us what we need to put forth the effort. But are we doing it? We're a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If we are, we're enduring hardness. Then we come to verse 4 today. And it says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So we're not only supposed to, uh, as a good soldier, endure hardness, but we're also supposed to please the captain. A good soldier pleases his captain. Now this deals with our dependability. Not our durability, that's enduring hardness. But when we, when we please the captain, this is our dependability. And before we jump into verse 4, I want you to go back to Joshua chapter 5 with me. Because I want to ask this question, who is the captain that chose us? Who is the captain? Look at Joshua chapter 5. And I want to tell you in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, we already found out last week that we are a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So, spoiler alert, Jesus is the captain. But let's go back to Joshua chapter 5, and I know you're going to say, but, but Jesus isn't in Joshua chapter 5. Jesus isn't in the Old Testament. Well, let's just look at some things here before we jump to conclusions. Uh, Joshua chapter 5 and verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Good question. Good question. And he said, this is the man with the sword drawn in his hand. He said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord I am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So the captain of the Lord's host is Jesus Christ. This is Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. This is a, what we call a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. This means an appearance of Jesus before he was robed in flesh at Bethlehem. As a baby, as a man, he appeared. We also make the statement that the Jehovah God of the Old Testament is the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. The same God that the Israelites worship, the Jehovah God, Elohim, Adonai, um, whatever name you want to call him by from the Old Testament that he had that described his character, is describing the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ did not have a beginning, and he does not have an end. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Never had a beginning, never had an end. So how do we know that this is Jesus Christ? Because surely it didn't say, he didn't say, I'm Jesus Christ, the captain of the Lord's host here. But that's why you compare scripture with scripture. And this was Jesus, we believe it was Jesus, because no angel is recorded in the word of God as having received worship of men. Now, this captain of the Lord's host that showed up here, he's receiving worship from Joshua. He allowed Joshua to kneel down before him and worship him there. So it wasn't just any angel appearing out of nowhere to him. But this was Jesus because we also find in Revelation chapter 19, if you look at Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, the Bible says this, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. By the way, this is Jesus Christ. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That will bring you back to John chapter 1, verse 1. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he, should, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the, and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, that's Jesus Christ, and he's the captain of the host there. He's the one leading the army. He's leading us in the army uh, there. And... Uh, He's the captain of all the armies that are in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you can recall some other times, and we won't take time to go to the scriptures, of the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ in the Word of God. Now, this is an exhaustive list, but um, Jesus appeared to a man, uh, as a man to Abraham in the, plans of, in the plains of Mamre. If you want to go back and look at that in, in Genesis chapter 18, you'll find um, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ appeared as a man to Jacob and wrestled with him in Genesis chapter 32. Then Jesus appeared as a man in the fiery furnace with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or if you want to say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, there in Daniel chapter 3. The Bible actually says that the king said, there's one that looks like the Son of God. <laughs> so Jesus, before he was ever robed in flesh was always alive and well. He had no beginning because he is God. And the Lord always comes to us when we need him and in the way we need him. He's always been revealing himself progressively throughout the ages to men. We have some of that written in the Bible for us. But he progressively reveals himself. And then he was, by the way, declared. He was declared when he came, became a man. He was declared to us to be the Son of God. So, the captain of the Lord of hosts is Jesus Christ. And he is our captain as a child of God. And he has chosen us, the Bible says, and we're to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so, he's not only the captain of the whole army, but he's the captain of our salvation, the Bible tells us. In Hebrews chapter 2, if you'll go with me there, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, the Bible says, But we see Jesus... That's a good thing to see. <laughs> if you're looking, you can find him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. What does that mean? That means he was made a man. We're lower than the angels. And then the Bible says, crowned with, uh, I'm sorry, for the suffering of death. That's why he was made a man, so he could die. Crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So he became a man without ceasing to be God so that he could pay for the sins of man in his perfect sinless blood. Then verse 10 says this, For it became him, who? Jesus Christ. For whom are all things and by whom are all things. So it's telling us that he 
is the creator of all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, the word perfect here means to be complete or adequate. This is referring to Jesus' suffering as our substitute in order to be a complete and adequate Savior. What He's done for us, the captain of our salvation. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Let's just compare some scriptures here. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 Beginning in verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, that who is the Lord, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, that's Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. By the way, there is no other way to be redeemed. There is no way to have your sins forgiven, but through the blood of Jesus. That's what the Bible says in verse 14. Who, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, so him becoming a man became visible, but being the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, listen, by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created. I thought he just started in Bethlehem. No, he's the one that created everything in Genesis 1.1. And then it says, created the, uh, all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, so even before the earth, the things that are in heaven, so he was previous even to that. Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That's what we saw in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And I'm glad he's keeping everything together. But the same one that's our redeemer is our creator. And he's the captain of our salvation. John 19, 30, Jesus said on the cross there, It is finished. He had done everything that he set out to do and taste death for every man when he laid down his physical life to bear our sins on himself. Look at 1 Timothy 4, 10. I'm just talking about salvation. Don't get too excited. <laughs> Don't be too excited that you have a captain who went before you to take care of everything for you to pay for your salvation. I mean, he just did it all. He just finished it all for us. I'm not twiddling my thumbs today, and I'm not trying to figure out how much good I can do in my life today to get salvation. I've already got it. And I know that because he changed my life. I hope you're living in your salvation today and not loathing it. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Listen to what the Bible says. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God. Now listen, it just said the living God. That's who we trust in. And then the Bible says this about the living God. Who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So the living God is the same one that's the Savior. Who's the Savior? Jesus Christ is our Savior. But the living God's our Savior. So Jesus Christ as the living God is our Savior, and it says that He's the Savior of all men. That's potentially. He could save every man because any man can come to Him. But it says specially, specially of those that believe. So Jesus is able to potentially save all men, but He will specifically or specially save those that believe on Him. Just like we read in John 1, 12. You believe and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There. Jesus is the Savior, but listen, is He your Savior? There's a difference between Him being the Savior and Him being your Savior. I believe for a long time that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose from the dead because I saw it in pictures and I, and I heard about it from a, a, a cult that I was in as a, little, as a young boy. But I didn't know him as my Savior. I knew him as dying on the cross and being buried and raised from the dead. But I didn't understand all that. I didn't understand what he had done for me. And he was not my Savior. So he can be the Savior here in your head. But unless he's your Savior in your heart, you don't know him. And you can't be a good soldier 
Not for Jesus. Not for Jesus, you can't. So he's the captain of our salvation, but he's also the captain of our service. I want you to go back to Joshua chapter 5. I've got to tell you all this before we get into 2 Timothy 4, or verse 4, there in chapter 2. Joshua chapter 5. Let's look back here at verse 14 and 15. So he's saying he's the captain of our service because look at what Joshua did. After he confronted him, not knowing who he was, ready to do battle with him, now the Bible says, And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell down on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What sayest my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord of Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where all now standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now we also know this is God because Moses, the angel that was in the burning bush and uh, that met with Moses, also told him the same thing. And only God requires that. Only God requires that. Now listen, he's the captain of his service, so what do I mean? He realized that he wasn't the captain anymore, Joshua. He realized this was the captain. The Lord did not come to be a captain. He came to be the captain. There's a big difference in Jesus being a God and Jesus being the God. I mean, you can go to a church today, a church setting, and you'll find people who will tell you that Jesus is a God. If you want to go do that, I mean, you can go to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints down the road, and they'll tell you that Jesus is a God, but they won't tell you that he's the God. And there is no other, there never will be another. He's the one and only. You can't become God, he is the God. You can go to the whole Jehovah's Witnesses and they'll talk about him being a God, but they won't tell you that he's the God because they don't believe that. So, he is the captain. But there's a difference in him being a captain and you acknowledging he's a captain. Now, Joshua knew he was the captain when he stepped up and he said what he said, but then he made him the captain. Joshua realized that now he was second in command, and Joshua was humbled and yield, yielded to the Lord in his leading there. He asked him, what do you want me to do? That's a, that's a pretty big uh, indicator in your life if Jesus is the captain, because you're asking him, what do you want me to do? Not, you're telling Jesus what you're going to do. See, that stopped in Joshua's life. When he acknowledged who it was, he said, what do you want me to do? And by the way, he also obeyed him. Now the question was not what side the Lord was on, but was Joshua on the Lord's side? Everything swapped. You see how he met him? Hey, what side are you on? Are you for us or are you for our enemy? He said, I'm the captain. Now Joshua had to make a decision. <laughs> Am I going to get on his side? Have you ever met the Lord that way? And said, so I got to get on his side. Quit trying to make the Lord for you. You know, there's, a, there's divisions all over the place. We can be divided by things. Well, the Lord's for what I'm doing, but not for what you're doing. Okay? But the greater question is, are you on the Lord's side? Are you on the Lord's side? Not is the Lord for you, but are you for the Lord in your life? Is he the captain of our service. The Lord gave Joshua a new and refreshed vision of who he was there, and we must have a refreshed daily vision of the Lord. So Jesus is the captain, but is he your captain? You'll never be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and I'll never be a good soldier of Jesus Christ if he is not our captain. Not just in the word, but in deed. So let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 now that we laid that groundwork. And I made everybody excited this morning uh, with that. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. The Bible says, No man that warreth, that means you're warring as a good soldier of Jesus Christ because you're enduring hardness. It says, Entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So we said, Who is the captain that chose us? Well, that's Jesus Christ. But how are we to please the captain? Well, first of all, we find here it says, no man that warreth. To please our captain, we have to be warring. Not just warring, but warring by faith. Warring by faith. 
When biblical faith is exercised, then biblical warring will follow in our life because we'll be following Him. It is a deliberate action that we take on the inner command of Jesus Christ, our captain, to war, to go forward with Him. Are you warring? Do you have any desire to war in this battle? Because there's a battle going on. And I'm not talking about the battle of, of left and right, right? Um, the Democrats or the Republicans. I'm not talking about that. There is a battle going on. There is division. But that's not the battle. The battle's between good and evil, between the Lord, the captain of the host, and the demonic army of the devil. There's a battle we don't see going on that manifests itself here in the natural that we see in the temporal through our flesh and the desires of men. And we have to war there, and it's by faith. So the Bible goes on and says, uh, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. So to please the captain, we know it's not only be warring, but we cannot get distracted by sight. The Bible says, entangleth himself with the affairs of, of this life. The word entangleth is a, it's in passive inaction and means to be woven into or involved in, just like you weave clothes, one thing over another, in order to make clothes that, that fit right in there. They last a long time. You got, right, the more threads you put in something, a sheet or anything, it's going to last longer. And, uh, and it's going to be better quality. And that's what the kind of idea, that entangling. And this reveals to us that the affairs of this life weave themselves into our life when we're not active for the Lord as a good soldier. When you're just sitting around doing nothing for the Lord, you become, in all practicality, a soldier of the devil. The things of this world start weaving themselves into your life. And before you know it, they overtake you. You think about poison oak or poison ivy or even kudzu. What's going to happen if you just let it go? It's going to be on everything. Everything. And that's what this world is like that we're living in. The, the, the affairs of this life, that's exactly how it's like. If we're not actively warring, then the things of this world will make themselves part of our life. And it's not because we said we want it to be. I don't think anybody says, hey, I want, kudzu is so beautiful, I want it to overrun my yard, my garden, I want it to overrun my house, I love it to just climb up on my house and just be all over the place, that's beautiful, I don't think most people think that way, um, but if you don't do anything about it, you're letting it do that, you're letting it, and that's warring, and, and in that war, these things don't get entangled in your life, the Bible's saying, now distractions will cause us to be hit by the enemy's fiery darts. We know he's against us. We find that in Ephesians 6. He's firing darts at us, trying to get us, trying to wound us. And we become vulnerable, vulnerable and turn away from the enemy. When we just get distracted, we turn away from the enemy. We turn away from warring and we get entangled with the things of this world. We can be passively distracted by others. Meaning, when we're in the battle together, and you have a war situation, and you're fighting the enemy, just imagine that our, our, our soldiers are going into war, and they're going head straight into the war, and beside them, soldiers are getting taken down, getting shot, dropping. That's pretty distracting, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? When there's casualties in the war, you want to stop and you want to help. But if you're on the front line, you've got to keep going because you've got to keep pressing forward. And then another one drops. And that's very distracting. And if you turn to check on them, you're going to get shot. And casualties. You know what? Casualties happen in the Lord's army. But it's not because of the Lord. It's because of us. And you probably could think of somebody in your mind right now this morning that, could, that was a casualty. They're no longer in church. They're no longer in our church, but they're no longer in any church. They don't ever pick their Bible up anymore, as far as you know. They don't want to talk about the Lord anymore. They're a casualty. And if we're not careful, we'll get distracted by that person that became a casualty because of their own fault, not because of the Lord, because he's the captain. And we see in Revelation, when he comes back, we're not even going to have to lift a finger. He's going to take care of everything by the word of his mouth. It's not the captain's fault. It's a casualty. But don't get your eye off on somebody else. Too many are already doing that. Well, I'm never going to church again because somebody uh, 
They just made me feel bad. They offended me. Really? Did, has anybody ever offended you in Walmart? Then don't go back. Has your doctor ever offended you? Then don't go back to your doctor. Has your mechanic ever offended you? Then don't go back to your mechanic. No, you wouldn't use that same logic. Nobody would use that same logic. That's because it's flawed. The problem is us, it's not the captain. And there's going to be casualties around us because people have, and God is so gracious to give us our own choice to make our own decisions. And if you want to become a casualty and make your own decisions not to follow God, then that's what you'll become. But it'll be against Him working by the Holy Spirit in your life to become that. Because He wants you to war, and He wants you not to be entangled with the affairs of this life. So we can become passively distracted as we get our eyes on other people. By the way, keep your eyes on the Lord. We can be passively distracted by our life's obstacles. There's a lot of obstacles that you and I face. Your obstacles may be different than my obstacles. But we have them. And we could get overcome by the obstacles that we have to go through in life. And you could be distracted from following the Lord because you got your eyes off on an obstacle. And sometimes, I mean, they're legitimate, right? We have legitimate obstacles. Some of them aren't. Some of them we make these big obstacles in our life and say, well, I can't get over that thing. But some of them are our own making. But some of them are legitimate. And so we can get caught up in that and we can have desires that come between us and the Lord but we have to give up our desires for the captain's desires. That's hard. That's hard. That means you have to die to self. Because you have wants and you have things you want to do. And you have to give those up. If you're going to be warring and not entangled in the affairs of this life. He that is entangled by the affairs of this life will do little about the affairs of the next life. It's just true. Meaning that we don't need to live for the temporal, but we need to live for the eternal. And if we're so caught up in the temporal, that we'll do nothing for the eternal. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I think we ought to take care of both of them, by the way, but they need to be in the right order. We take care of eternal things, and the temporal things come. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look with me at verse 14. Or 16. For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For while we look not at the things which are seen, that's the temporal things, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are are eternal. Where do we have our eyes on? The affairs of this life? The temporal things? Look at, look at 1 John. The devil's given us a lot to look at. And I know I talk about this verse a lot because we need to memorize it and we need to know it. We don't need to be ignorant about the devil's devices. In 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, he says, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Aren't you glad you can overcome the wicked one? You can do that. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, that's the affairs of this life, getting entangled with them, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we have the lust of the flesh, the desire to do, the lust of the eyes, the desire to have, and the pride of life, the desire to be. And that's what the affairs of this life cover, our fleshly desire to do, to have, and to be. And if we get caught up and that's all we are, to do, to have, to be. I wake up tomorrow, to do, to have, to be. And we get caught up in the affairs of this life, we're not going to be a good soldier, we're not going to please our captain if it's all about doing and having and being. and doing, Unless it's being who we ought to be for the Lord. <laughs> if that's what we are concerned about, then our doing will be what the Lord wants us to do. The idea is that 
We, we need to be free from the entanglements of this world in order to obey the captain. We are talking about Jude on Sunday nights, and in Jude uh, verse 3, the Bible says, Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. By faith we earnestly contend for the faith. This is that warring. This is that enduring hardness. This is pleasing the captain. What are we earnestly contending for in our lives? Are we earnestly contending for our marriage and our family? Are we earnestly contending for our testimony? Are we earnestly contending for our walk with the Lord? Listen, any, any kind of excuse can come along why you can't walk with God. Oh, I just didn't have time to read my Bible today. I didn't have time to pray today. I didn't have time to tell anybody about Jesus or hand out a tract today. I didn't have time to do anything spiritual today because I'm so entangled with the things of this world. Now, you wouldn't say it that way. And I wouldn't say it that way. We'd gloss it over. And we'd say, I didn't get to read my Bible today because of this excuse. And we would, we would justify that. We would justify not walking with God the way we ought to walk with Him. But we're earnestly contending for something in our life. Maybe it's our, what about our personal witness to a lost world? Are we earnestly contending for that? What about our church family's unity? Us being in one accord with each other. How about that? Are we earnestly contending for that? That's, the great, that's one of the greatest witnesses to a lost world. When they can walk into a church meeting and people love each other and love the Lord. I don't know of anything greater than that other than your own personal witness to somebody that they need to see. Maybe we're earnestly contending for ourselves. Our TV time, we've got to have it. Our leisure time, we've got to have it. Our fun time, our reputation time, we've we got to keep up everything. We've got to do everything right. Are we earnestly contending for that? Does that really matter for eternity? Either we are contending for the Lord or we're contending against the Lord, period. Period. So to please the captain, we cannot get distracted by sight. But in closing, to please our captain is the chief end of our salvation. It says that he, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. That's the chief end of our salvation. Why did, we even get, why did the Lord even save us? To live for him. To please him. Look at, uh, look at Genesis 5 with me. I'm going to take a look at uh, this man Enoch really quick. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 22, the Bible says here, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Now I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 11. So it says he walked with God. And in Hebrews chapter 11, it gives us a little more insight into Enoch, beginning in verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. When he started walking with him, he pleased him. The chief end of the salvation was to please God. Maybe Enoch didn't even believe or want to follow God until after he had Methuselah. Then he started walking with him and pleased him. And it was by faith. How do we know that? Because verse 6 tells us it's coupled with verse 5 about Enoch, and it says this in verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Talking about the Lord. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have faith? The end of your salvation is to please the Lord. We can only please him by faith. As we have so received the Lord, the Bible says that we ought to walk in him. We received him by faith. We ought to walk in him by faith. We ought to continue to walk in him by faith. Look at John chapter 8 with me. John chapter 8 and verse 29. The Bible says, and Jesus was speaking, and he said, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. By the way, he'd never leave us nor forsake us either. For I do always those things that... What did he say? Please him. Now, we know Jesus was God-man, and we know that he was perfect, and he always did that which pleased the Father. But we have the Father with us. 
and, and he gives us the power to please him because we can trust him and have faith. Romans chapter 8 and verse 8. The Bible says here, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Not maybe not, cannot. If you're not walking in the Spirit, which is by faith, you can't please God. We can't please God. And that's the chief end of our salvation. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. For I do, uh, or for do I now persuade men or God? That's a good question. Are we living for men or for God? Are we trying to persuade God of something or men of something? Or do I seek to please men? Are we trying to please God or please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Wow. So if we serve God, then we're not worried about pleasing men. We're worried about pleasing Him. This is part of pleasing the captain. Turn me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and we're done. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you. So he's begging them and he says we want to encourage you. And what is he trying to encourage them to do? To exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ that ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God. He said, we taught you how you ought to live your life and how you're to please God. And then he says this, so ye would abound more and more. He says, we've taught you, and what we want you to do is do it and do it more and more. There's no time to stop. There's no time to stop pleasing the captain. We not only can be a good soldier by faith, but we must be a good soldier by faith in order to please the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that you, you give us the command to be a good soldier because you've chosen us to be a soldier. But you give us everything else. In the context here, you give us your grace. And we're so thankful for your grace because in that grace, we're able to do everything that order, ordinarily we would not be able to do. Your grace is sufficient for us. And we're thankful for that. And we do want to be a soldier because we do realize that there's a battle going on and that you're our captain and we want to please you. Please help us to endure the hardness. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today and you say, Brother Justin, I'm on my way to hell today. I know I've never received Jesus as my Savior. I never knew I needed to receive Jesus as my Savior. I just thought believing that He was a Savior, that He died on the cross was good enough, but I've never personally made Him my own. I've never realized I was a sinner separated from God, and the only way I could be made friends of God and adopted into God's family, become a child of God there, was by Jesus Christ and receiving Him as my Savior and He'll give me eternal life. If you say, that's me today, I never realized that, but today I realize that, and I'm concerned about my soul, and I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. Would you raise your hand and say, that's me, Brother Justin? I don't know Jesus, but I, sure, I understand today I need Him. He's not my captain. Anybody like that? We'd sure love to help you. If you have any concerns about that today, don't leave here without knowing Jesus as your Savior, and you can if you desire to know Him in your heart. Now, believers, altars are open. If you want to talk to the Lord as He's spoken to you. But I'm going to ask you a couple of questions here before we close. Are you warring for the captain? Are you warring for the captain? There's a battle raging. You don't even have to go very far. You know how far you got to go? You got to wake up in the morning. And you're already on the battlefield. Either we're going to say yes or we're going to say no in the war. That's what we're going to do. Are you warring? you got to make up your mind, Lord, I'm going to war for you. I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to face the battle. Are you entangled by the world? Maybe that's what the Lord spoke to you about. I'm sure he could speak to all of us here in some way, form, or fashion, that we're being entangled because of our just not paying attention, not taking it seriously. The world is creeping into our life and entangling us, and we don't even know how far gone we are in the entanglement. Maybe you need to ask the Lord to help you. I trust you are. And are you pleasing the Lord? That's the chief end of your salvation. 
You say, yes, I know Jesus as my Savior. Then why not live for him? Why not want to trust him and have faith in him? Why not live for him that way? I know your flesh doesn't want to. My flesh doesn't want to. My flesh didn't want to get up this morning. Maybe yours didn't either. My flesh didn't want to war yesterday on the Capitol building steps preaching a not a so popular message. It's a war going on. <clears throat> We're going to please the Lord. The only way you can do it is by faith. That means you just trust Him. You just trust what He said. You believe Him. Maybe you're here today and say, Brother Justin, I'm, I'm saved, but I've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. I know I need to. I desire to. Well, we'd love to help you with that. We'd love to talk to you about it because that's important. That's part of warring. That's part of making known that Jesus is your captain and that He is not only the captain, but He's the captain of your life. And maybe you're here and you say, Brother Justin, I've been saved. I've been baptized too since I've been saved. But I've never, I've, I don't have a church home or I'm looking for one. And I believe this is where the Lord had me to be, put my life and influence here. Well, we'd love to talk with you about that. And let you know what it means to be a member of Grace Baptist Church. And, and uh, to love the Lord, serve Him here, use your influence here for the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever the Lord's speaking to your heart about, we sure do want to help you that way. But I want you to respond to the Lord because He's the one that can help you. Be a good soldier. That would change everything about our life if we determined to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the encouragement in your word that we find. Thank you for the things that you rebuke us about in your word that we come across. Lord, we have so much that probably needs to be rebuked in our lives. And we're thankful that you're so loving that you do that to protect us and to help us and to show us where we're wrong and where we can get right, how to get right, how to stay right. Father, thank you for all you do for us. May we be good soldiers. May we determine some things in our life. Oh, it's not going to be easy. It never is. If there's some things that are entangling lives today and you've identified it in someone's life and they're willing to say yes to you, Lord, would you help them with that? Would you give them the grace to untangle themselves from it? Please do that for us, Lord. We want to be active in your war. Please give us the uh, understanding to walk in it, to walk by faith. Well, thank you, and we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.